on this edition of Independent Sources, Alternative Healing, What's Behind the Resurgence of the Use of Traditional Herbs in Personal Health Care. And Worldwise, we learn more about one of New York City's leading organizations in holistic learning and world culture. Welcome to Independent Sources, I'm Viano Ravinka. This week we're coming to you from the Open Center in Midtown Manhattan. The center calls itself the largest urban holistic center in the United States. We'll start the show by learning a little bit more about the organization and the programs it offers. My colleague Marlene Peralta is already inside with one of the center's co-founders. Marlene? Thanks, Vianara. I'm here with Ralph White, who is one of the co-founders of the Open Center and is also the creative director. Thank you for welcoming us to the Open Center. Oh, my pleasure, Marlene. Great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Open Center? Yes, well, the Open Center began in uh, January 1984, and uh, we call ourselves New York's leading center of holistic learning and world culture. And uh, what does that mean, some of the viewers might think or wonder? Well, we cover really five primary areas. One is we have programs, really it's a year-round set of programs, workshops, lectures, trainings, conferences, performances. Uh, first of all, in the area of the body. Um, secondly, in relation to the psyche. Uh, thirdly, in the spiritual or contemplative or meditative areas. Uh, from the whole spectrum of world culture, whether it's Tibetan Buddhism, Zen, uh, Jewish or Christian traditions. It could be anything from all the world's spiritual and religious traditions. Uh, we also cover the arts and creativity and holistic approaches to science. And last but certainly not least, we cover uh, ecological and social change as well. Once you get into the Open Center, it's a, a lot of different uh, activities and programs that you offer. Can you give yes. us examples? Well, you know, there have been so many people who come here over the years. We've had about a quarter of a million participants who've come through during that time. And uh, some of the examples might be everything here. For instance, West African dance. I'd mentioned the body, movement, martial arts, healing. Everything relates to health and well-being and holistic and integrative approaches to health. So whether that's West African dance, whether that's flamenco in terms of movement, um, in terms of the psyche and psychology, uh, Jungian approaches that come from uh, the work of uh, Carl Jung, from all kinds of more uh, holistic views of the unconscious and the psyche. This is a conference that we did uh, about 10 years ago uh, in Italy on the Italian Renaissance on uh, Florence. Many people don't know that uh, the original uh, Egyptian, Jewish, Greek impulses that came together from the Hermetic, Kabbalistic, Neoplatonic philosophers that really helped shape the whole Italian Renaissance from the Academy of Marsilio Ficino in Florence. Uh, we've also done a conference here on the whole traditions of uh, King Arthur and the Holy Grail. Uh, Joseph Campbell called it the core myth of Western civilization, and that was a conference that we did in Wales there. Next year, we're planning on doing in June a conference. It's called, it's an esoteric quest for ancient Alexandria, Greco-Egyptian birthplace of the Western mind, and that's co-sponsored with the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, the new library of Alexandria that's built on the site of the ancient library that really was the, was the world's, world's first great library and university, the legendary library of Alexandria. And this conference will seek to bring alive that whole wonderful period of about, from say 300 BC to 400 AD, when Alexandria was without question the cultural capital of antiquity, more so than Rome or, uh, or Athens, and yet it tends to, it's faded somewhat from memory. But it was like New York in a way. It was a world city. It was a cosmopolis. It was a place where all these different cultural streams flowed together, everything from the known world, down the Nile from Africa. There were even people coming from India because Alexander's empire stretched all the way to India, and of course from the, all the 
borders of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. So those are the kinds of uh, international conferences that we do. Great. And how can people have access to these um, programs at the Open Center? Do they have to become members? No, they don't have to. It's always nice if they do become members. But, uh, you know, it goes on pretty much year-round. Uh, they can just go to the Open Center website, opencenter.org, if they want to find out about uh, what's happening here. Or there are catalogs. We produce catalogs that are in um, we can, the people can call up and we can mail it to them. Or often many you know, natural food stores, natural food restaurants, yoga centers and the like will carry open center catalogs. So you can just pick them up. So it's a year-round range of all those programs that I mentioned, lectures, workshops, conferences, trainings, performances, and so on. Thank you very much for letting us know about the Open Center. Oh, my pleasure. Ralph White, Creative Director and Co-Founder of the Open Center. Now we go to Abby Shola, who has some news from the ethnic media. Thanks, Marlene. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. El Correo de Queens reports that Roosevelt Avenue in Queens has become a no-man's land. According to the report, the predominantly Latino area between 69th and 111th Streets near Roosevelt Avenue has become a hangout for undocumented laborers, prostitutes, pole dancers, and unlicensed vendors. Many of the residents there have moved out of the area, causing ethnic enclaves like Little Colombia, Little Argentina, and Little Dominican Republic to shrink. Democrat council member Julissa Ferreras, who lives on Roosevelt Avenue, says a new law needs to be created to rescue the area from deteriorating any further. Several reporters have sounded off about a Forbes.com article titled, If I Were a Poor Black Kid. Following Obama's speech on economic inequality, Forbes.com blogger Gene Marks posted an article that gives advice to poor black children on how to overcome poverty. Voices of New York compiled negative reviews on the article from websites like Colorlines.com, Dominion of New York, and ScientificAmerican.com. A Forbes.com staff reporter also responded, criticizing Marx for purposely choosing a controversial angle for the story to drive web traffic to the article. From the Jewish Forward, Jewish fundraisers from President Obama's 2008 campaign are sticking by him as he seeks re-election in 2012. Republican groups like the Emergency Committee for Israel and the Republican Jewish Coalition have been using Obama's Middle East policy to deter American Jews from supporting him. Yet all of his Jewish fundraisers who helped raise over a half a million dollars for 2008 have returned for 2012. Campaign fundraisers say the hard part will be getting people to contribute, not only because of U.S.-Israel relations, but also due to the grim economy. And finally, Koreans in the tri-state area are missing their favorite freebie for the new year. Korean businesses usually give their customers promotional store calendars to usher in the new year. But because of the economic slowdown, many businesses have either canceled the gesture for 2012 or reduced the amount they print. Korea Daily reports that Korean businesses selling electronics and appliances have experienced 30 to 40 percent drops in revenue since the recession hit. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic media. Back to Vianora at the Open Center. Thanks, Abby. A recent report from the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Undeserved found that more Americans were turning to complementary and alternative medicines to deal with their ailments. The report cited the skyrocketing cost of modern medicine as one of the reasons for this phenomenon. With me to talk a little bit about this and the origins of traditional medicine are BMCC professor Kwesi Kunadu and Dr. Aparna Bapat. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Kanadu, you've studied and uh, written about the African traditional medicine. Talk a little bit about uh, that, give us a little bit of uh, perspective, and um, also how that might apply within the community here in New York. As an historian, which is my departure for looking at medicine, most people in the world up until the early 20th century, in fact, employ some form of traditional indigenous medicine where the vast majority of the world were farmers. So people had some connection to the land, and therefore that connection to the land, I think, facilitated the use of plant and other organic uh, medicines being used. It was only until perhaps the mid-20th century where 
what was called tropical medicine, which was a function of colonialism in Africa, in Asia, um, and experimentation out of that tropical medicine um, moment where allopathic or biomedicine became the more modern or contemporary form. However, as you noted, uh, with the cost of, of biomedicine and the stigma of elitism attached to it in many African communities, even diasporic African communities, people with the option of biomedicine tend to prefer the traditional or indigenous medicine because it is not only cost effective where rather than the biomedicine where individuals had to pay via their own pockets, in the traditional medicine one has, one has kinship, that is a family network from which to use in-kind gifts, when to use other non-financial resources to pay for the treatment. Secondly, um, prices are unfixed in the traditional system whereby healers typically will um, provide service to an individual or community and then the individual community would pay after the treatment is successful. So it's more of an um, effective, efficacy-based system. And I think lastly, uh, with the cost and also the availability of certain medical um, paraphernalia, syringes, and um, pharmaceutical medicine be so expensive and out of reach of many rural dwellers in Africa, especially, people have the recourse to traditional medicine that only deals with the body, but also psycho psychosomatic trauma, deal with um, you know, interpersonal relationships and those kind of matters that people find, I think, a more holistic approach to life. And I think that's what gives it so much currency. Dr. Bapat, um, in India, the Ayurvedic um, uh, tradition is a long-standing uh, tradition of alternative uh, medicine. Tell us how that's being applied within the Indian American community here, how much of that information is being uh, carried here. Right, so in India, Ayurvedic medicine has been in practice since uh, thousands of years. It's a time-tested science. So. Um, as a part of our culture and as a part of our upbringing, we get to know a lot of home remedies and a lot of aspects of food and environment and uh, different herbs that can be found in the kitchen, like the spices and herbs like turmeric or black pepper, how, uh, how to use them as medicine. That is a part of uh, growing up for most of the um, Indians. So uh, when even when we come to the West, we still carry our kitchens and all our uh, cooking ingredients and our cooking styles with us. And uh, that is why I think um, it is a part of uh, almost every Indian family uh, that they take this Ayurvedic medicine as the first step uh, into healing. And then if there is any uh, thing that needs to be addressed with uh, more advanced diagnostic techniques or more advanced uh, Western type of medical approach, then that, that would be something taken as the next step. And your um, general practitioner in Ayurvedic medicine, right. who are your customers here in the New York area? Are there Indian Americans or uh, non-Indian. Well, unfortunately, the Indian Americans are not uh, very much into Ayurvedic uh, medicine when it comes to uh, going to a practitioner. They do practice some of the things that they know from their grandparents and, you know, as a part of our culture. Why but not? That's, of, that's quite surprising. One would think that given India's uh, tradition. Like, um, like Dr. Kwasi said, it was um, a part of uh, colonization and how how the whole culture was influenced by the Western approach of uh, healing in the last few, you know, hundred years. And that has been uh, very strong when we even go back to India and look at the uh, medical system over there. It's definitely the Western biomedicine is uh, highly preferred. But now that, you know, the trend is kind of setting back into, uh, and, like, exploring more alternatives, uh, one of the reason, um, apart from what he mentioned, is uh, people are facing a lot of side effects of Western medicine. Um, and that is one of the reasons why it is really having them explore some alternatives. Also, uh, the Ayurvedic uh, medicine, we have to point out, that also has its critics where they say it's not been checked enough and some 
parts of it, you know, can be dangerous. So one would have to apply caution with that too. Yeah, of course. I mean, even if it is us, anything that is very safe, if it is wrongly used, then there would be any kind of, uh, you know, any anything if we use it incorrectly or wrongly or without proper guidance, then that would definitely create a disturbance. But on its own, Ayurvedic medicine, because there are pure herbs and um, the remedies that are tested over th hundreds and thousands of years, uh, they don't really have a side effect built into them. And another reason is also that um, people have, um, uh, you know, uh, there are some diseases the, of uh, modern urban life that have really no remedy or no cure in the Western medicine, uh, like autoimmune conditions, for example. So for those reasons, people do want to explore the areas of Ayurveda. Professor Kanadu, you've mentioned the high cost of uh, medicine and that being a reason for which people are turning to herbal medicine. Um, could it also be uh, that there's been a movement of patient empowerment that we've been seeing in the media, for example, and uh, people are looking for alternatives and perhaps there's also uh, a different relationship between conventional medicine and traditional medicine at this point in time. Well, I think to that question and to what was said a moment ago, most traditional indigenous medicine is linked to the culture of the people who use those medicines as a recourse. And that culture usually has spiritual and other elements that bind people together. And so healers are successful in many traditional and even diasporic African communities like Jamaica, where my father's from, uh, Guyana, which has a large Indian population, Trinidad. They're successful not because they're an alternative, but because they are effective. That is, they can treat a range of human ailments, from the social to the psychosomatic to the spiritual, that is immaterial, to the very physiological diseases that one finds. So I think the, the holistic range that in biomedicine you're seen as a disease organism. That is, you're a patient, you have a number, you become this you know, object. Whereas in a therapeutic perspective from the indigenous world, you're seen as being a part of a community which there's an imbalance. And so I think the success has to do with, and plus there's a large immigrant African population and diasporic population in New York City, even with the option, even with healthcare for, through your employer, people still will go to their cabinets, will go to the health food store, will get the, from Jamaica, fever grass, will get the Circe bush, you know, a kind of, um, tea that can use for diarrhea and other and, you know, homo ailments. I think the empowerment part is that people therefore um, have what they need literally in their um, spice box or their kitchen at home and therefore people are empowered because they have the ability to self-heal themselves rather than have to go through a biomedical practitioner as one would go through a Catholic priest you know, for their religious experience. And we've got to take a break right now, but when we come back, we'll take a look at some of the essential herbs in a few of these traditional remedies. How you doing? My name's Steve. My family's lived in this neighborhood for years. Recently, things got so tight, we had to go to our local food bank for help. I lost a lot of sleep worrying about what the neighbors might think. That is until I saw them there, too. How'd I do, Steve? A little stiff. If you could have done a little what? better. What? Come on. You know, I have an Academy Award. Yeah, but not for playing me. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Thanks for staying with us. I'm here with Dr. Aparna Bapat and Professor Kwesi Kanadu. They're going to walk us through some of the herbs and treatments used more frequently in alternative medicine. And we're going to talk specifically about herbs for colds today. Before we start though, we advise you at home to consult your doctor before taking any of these uh, uh, herbal remedies, uh, especially if you have a condition or um, if, if you um, are taking any other medication. So let's start with uh, Dr. Conado. What do we have here? We, we are gonna start with sage. Yes, uh, sage is um, a wonderful plant. Uh, it has an aromatic smell. It, Usually we use the stem and the leaves. You can use the sage for a spice, to flavor food, and many of you uh, viewers would probably know sage from what they have in their pantry. Mm -hmm. Also from the local markets, they'll find sage. 
And you mentioned the aroma, and it's also used for burning as incense. Indeed, it's used for burning incense, and it also has certain spiritual qualities, whereby if one wanted to spiritually cleanse a room or a house, you can burn sage with, let's say, rosemary, another um, very easy to find, inexpensive plant that one can find in a local market or shop. Um, sage, um, beyond its, the quality of a spice, it also has some herbal uh, properties whereby um, sage either as a tea or um, used sometimes as a bath uh, it has anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, it also can be used for rheumatoid arthritis. And how do you use those, those leaves specifically? Well, um, they can be used in the form of a tea whereby um, one can actually, there's a, a metal strainer, strainer mm -hmm. which one can use to strain as a tea. And that's probably the simplest way because the tea allows it to get into the bloodstreams very quickly and then it, the properties begin taking action. So tea probably is the best recommendation. You can also find these already in tea bags in some health food stores mm -hmm. for those who don't want to use the strainer. And you also have their cayenne, cayenne yes, pepper. Yes, uh, cayenne pepper is wonderful. <laughs> it is, um, many of your viewers will know this pepper. Um, again, it's in their pantry. Uh, they probably use it more often than they realize. And now, cayenne pepper, beyond being a spice, it also has um, properties. It's known to be a blood cleanser. That is, it allows one to um, clear coughs and colds. Uh, I use it, for example, my daughters when they have a cold, and it's cold season. So there's a mixture I use whereby cayenne pepper with um, a half a teaspoon of ginger, um, apple cider vinegar, and honey and a small mixture does well for two or three days to take care of that cold and that cough. So it's multi-purpose. Again, it's like sage, inexpensive, very accessible, and it's a wonderful all-year-round um, food as well as herbal medicine. Dr. Babat, we're yes. gonna start with the tea, Tulsi tea. Sure. Sometimes you find these in upscale spas in, in New York. It's so flavorful yeah. and it's got a very specific aroma and yes. we're learning today that it's very good for colds. Very good for cold. This is also called uh, holy basil. Uh, Tulsi has um, this name because uh, it is also used in worship in India. So pretty much every household would have a Tulsi plant in their, uh, in their home. And uh, it has uh, amazing qualities. You know, it is of course used in cold and congestion and coughs, but also for all kinds of viral fevers. And it helps to boost the immunity of the body. Next we have an oil. Yes, this right. is called Anutel. And uh, this oil is a blend of um, uh, several herbs in the base of sesame oil. And uh, this oil can be used as nose drops. So whenever uh, people have um, any kind of respiratory conditions or allergies, and uh, this oil can be used with the help of a dropper. Um, and when it is uh, put into the nostrils and inhaled, it uh, actually coats up the nasal passages and helps to uh, balance out any of those congestive factors. And uh, here we have this powder. Yes, that... this is called trikatu. Trikatu means uh, three pungents. It's a very, um, it's a combination of very spicy uh, heating uh, three pungents, which is uh, dry ginger, black pepper, and long pepper. And together what they do is they really open up any kind of congested pathways in the body. They help to um, improve the digestive and metabolic fire, thereby eliminating any kind of mucus buildup uh, that is very common in the cold season. And how do you use that? Uh, this can be used um, as a mixture, um, uh, about a quarter teaspoon, because it's very hot, spicy and hot, not more than quarter teaspoon at a time, um, mixed in honey. So mm. it gives that Again, kind honey. of a sweet <laughs> taste. And also honey is um, very good for um, the congestion no, to counteract the congestion. Mm -hmm. Now, where people can find these, some are very easy to find, of course, in just basic supermarkets like the cayenne pepper. Um, these, I'm guessing, Dr. Bapa, that you find them in Indian specialty Indian, stores? Right, Indian grocery stores or specialty stores. Now, here we have uh, different forms of administration. Professor Kanado, tell us um, if ethnicity maybe in any ways influence the form of, of, of administration? Do certain people prefer different uh, uh, types of, of uh, herbs in, in like a tea form, let's say, or some in a more commercially processed uh, form like pills? Well, it depends on the person and the ailment that they have. I think one of the great misnomers about medicine is that one size fits all. 
That is, we can all take a Tylenol or take a, a Motrin and then we're done. And usually the side effects is because the one size fit all doesn't work. And so some individuals uh, works best if it's in liquid form. Uh, we can also create a, um, a vapor and be able to use the gaseous form. Some people can use certain medicines, for example, um, in terms of burning sage or rosemary or thyme mixed together. And some can take a bath in some of these medicines. And so it really depends on the condition and the preference of the individual. I think the flexibility of herbal medicine allows one to use any or all of those methods. The Journal of uh, the American Pharmacists Association came up with uh, a study uh, putting um, uh, Hispanics uh, against uh, the non-Hispanic whites in their use of herbal remedies, and they found that uh, non-Hispanic whites preferred commercially processed uh, um, herbs like the ones you find in, in, in pharmacies, whereas uh, um, the rest uh, prefer raw raw herbs. Um, was that something that you found in your studies also, comparing different ethnic populations that, that you've observed? Yes, I think so, and because the most potent and therefore the most effective medicines are usually in the organic form. That is, you usually eat what's in your environment, your ecology, because whatever ailments are in that, that environment, the medicines are there in that environment. So for instance, the snake bite has the, has the antidote from that venom. That is, the malaria also has the um, plants to cure that malaria in that environment. So wherever one finds you know, a disease environment or an environment filled with these human maladies, they'll also find the medicines for it. It is only when people through migration or other kinds of uh, either free or unfree movement where they have to find other alternatives to deal with them. And I think people resort to the organic form because the potency, the effectiveness is in that form. And I'm just going to toss it this very quickly in a few seconds to Dr. Bapat. Since you have uh, patients here in New York of all ethnicities, do you find a difference in what people might prefer? Yes, uh, actually, um, people. Some people are very bold to uh, want, they, they want the herb to be experienced directly and uh, to taste it and to really have that effect through their whole system. But a lot of people actually prefer that to be covered with a capsule or to come in a standardized form so that they deliver only that active part of it. And that's why a lot of uh, companies are coming forward with uh, these kind of uh, single herbs that are um, isolated of their active ingredients and made into a capsule form. And in terms of ethnicity, you cannot uh, um, pinpoint uh, well, necessarily? Uh, uh, generally, the Ayurvedic traditional formulas are made into a variety of um, uh, ing like substances. They are blended either in, in the form of oil. Some are into jams. They are actually made into herbal jams. Some are into um, uh, potions like liquids like herbalized wines, and some are in the dry form that can be used as a tea. Dr. Bapat and Professor Kanadu, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. And we already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> you can't eat love, so I don't know how I'm going to feed them tonight. How was that, Rich? I think I look more like Denzel. <laughs> That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Well, that's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. For all our family here at Independent Sources, we would like to wish you and yours the best of the season and in the new year. And stay with us in 2012 when we will have more fun and fascinating stories from the city's rich ethnic tapestry. Till then, be independent-minded.